Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to a seminar sponsored by the Center for Teaching Excellence. Today's topic is uh, crisis response in and outside of the classroom. And we have three speakers. We have Scott Lewis, who is the Director of Judicial Affairs. We have uh, Pete Liggett, who is the Associate Director of the Counseling and Human Development Center. And we have Chris Wichnick, Deputy Director of Law Enforcement and Safety here on the University of South Carolina campus. So, um, get out of the way. Thank you. Go ahead and click to the third one. Um, what I want to remind everybody as we get started here is that what we put together today for you is really a summary of several presentations put on by our independent offices. The Office of Student Judicial Programs does these type of seminars regarding classroom disruption um, as well as uh, behavioral intervention, a little bit of the stuff we're going to talk about today, but they're a little bit longer. And so if you'd like for our staffs to come to your staffs or to your offices or set something up for a larger group again later, speaking to those individual sessions, um, how to manage classroom disruption or how to handle some behavioral intervention techniques, our office could certainly do that. The Counseling and Human Development Center also does ones on stress management, healthy relationships, and dealing with difficult students. Again, they have outreach where they can come to you or they can set something up on site. And the police department, USCPD, also does seminars on personal safety as well as campus safety, again, that they can bring to you. These are all of those sessions shrunk down mm -hmm. into an hour and 15 minutes. So think of this as just a very long preview trying to touch on some very pertinent issues. As you saw from the uh, seminar, and if you could go to the slide for just a moment, Chris, thanks. These are the questions that we're going to address today. They're the ones that we advertise that we would answer, and we feel like if we don't answer those questions particularly today, we will not have served our purpose. And so the proper response to a student's disruptive behavior, your role in dealing with student crisis, and what activity or symptoms should be addressed or reported, and to whom should you report them. Pete, if you'll go to the next one. Here's some terms we're going to cover today. Distressed, disturbed, dysregulated, disruptive, student in crisis, and classroom disruption. I'm not going to cover all those right now, but what you're going to notice is as we go through the course of today, those terms are going to be very subjective depending on the situation. There is no one that sets for all those terms. The way we're going to go through today is we're going to kind of handle it from different levels of intervention. What we would call sort of a level one intervention where you all, faculty and staff, would be our point individuals and that will be pretty consistent throughout. Then we'll move to a section where maybe the behavioral intervention team, which when you see BIT, that's what it stands for. And then finally, when does the police need to be involved or when do the police need to be involved? Um, Pete Liggett, the associate director of the Counseling Center and a psychologist in the Counseling Center, is going to start with uh, some early intervention with students. Pete? Thanks, Scott. Well, certainly uh, the issue of uh, mental health uh, on college campuses has been a pretty hot topic uh, for a number of years uh, over the last 10 years, and certainly in the last uh, three weeks it's been a, a very uh, prominent topic for uh, higher education administrators, uh, staff and faculty, and students. And so I want to touch a little bit on the notion of uh, what we're talking about as far as college mental health issues and, and how we handle those uh, at the University of South Carolina, but also some information for you to kind of help you uh, get an understanding of where we are uh, as, a, as a college uh, in dealing with these issues. First, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, campus mental health services. and. We've, uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, research on the topic of mental health issues in college students for the last 20 years, and we've seen an overall increase in the severity and the frequency uh, of college students presenting with uh, serious and persistent mental illnesses. This, I think, is due in part to uh, some students coming on campus with newer generation medications that allow them to function uh, in spite of having some pretty significant symptoms that might otherwise prevent them from functioning uh, on a college campus. As a college student in 1984, uh, I did not have classmates who took a lot of prescriptive medications to manage psychiatric uh, symptoms. Many of our students come to college campuses now on those medications and are, are dealing with pretty serious mental illnesses. Also, it's important to note that developmentally, uh, folks that represent uh, undergraduate student populations are really at that point that if they are going to have a serious mental illness, that is likely to emerge during their college years. The prevalence rates uh, for the past year for this population are typically around 40% of individuals are going to have some type of diagnosable mental illness. 
and almost 20% uh, of college students might have a diagnosable mental illness. I think it's important to note that as many as one in two college students will uh, experience a, si a significant depressive episode during their college career. So about half of our college students at some point during their time as an undergrad are going to experience a significant depressive episode. Um, and I think that the other uh, factor that's been really looked at is the, the role of the context within which students exist as college students now. The, the financial pressures of being in school, uh, some of the expectations placed on them from uh, the perspective of competing for uh, grades and uh, jobs afterwards are all important um, uh, role, things that are factors. Okay. So who are we talking about? We're talking about students who are uh, distressed, uh, disturbed or dysregulated, and disturbed uh, may mean disturbing. So it may not be that they experience themselves as being disturbed, but you experience them as being disturbing. Um, <laughs> the distressed uh, really fall into a few categories, emotionally troubled, individuals impacted by situational stressors, which are, are pretty uh, frequent and persistent throughout college. Uh, and then those with um, psychiatric uh, symptoms that are presenting. The disturbing students are those that are engaging in behaviors that are disruptive to the environment or the community in which they exist. And so these things can be uh, behavioral disruptions in classrooms, bizarre behaviors. It may be uh, things like uh, essays or emails that uh, an instructor or a staff person receive from a student that are disruptive. And then also substance abusing behavior that feeds into uh, aberrant behaviors uh, are another uh, category to look at it. This word dysregulated is uh, uh, becoming a uh, pretty uh, common and popular word in, in the mental health field. It's a word that really touches on the notion of an individual's inability to control themselves in a variety of different areas, whether it be emotionally, cognitively, in relationships, or managing themselves. And so a dysregulated student may be a student who is suicidal, uh, or somebody who engages in self-injurious behaviors, substance abusing behaviors, uh, hostile, aggressive, uh, relationally abusive, and then also, again, unable to regulate themselves in those, those various areas. Um, suicide is uh, another uh, important concept that we are, are faced with on college campuses. Certainly, um, some of the, uh, the, the lawsuits that have occurred uh, over the last five years uh, the Shin case uh, being a very prominent case, have really um, focused attention on the issue of suicide among college administrators, staff, and faculty. Um, I want to give you a few facts about that, though. The fact of the matter is, is that over the past 60 years, suicide rates have tripled, but in the last 10 years of, of us recording suicide rates, the rates have actually gone down. Uh, which is good news for us. We are waiting for more recent data to come in to see if it's going back up again or whether it's continuing the trend. Um, suicide is the number two uh, cause of death among college students. Accidental death is number one, and that accidental death encompasses a vi wide variety of, of types of incidents, including some students who we are unsure of whether they may have committed suicide or not. Uh, college campus, being on a college campus is a protective factor, though. The rates of suicide among college students is half of their, uh, their uh, cohort who are not in uh, college. Um, and that has a lot to do with the amount of services that are available to students. Um, and some researchers are suggesting that the fact that college campuses have very strict gun control uh, regulations is also uh, lends itself to that protective factor. Uh, folks wonder uh, frequently if we um, engage in the, pra the practice of using mandated counseling to deal with students who fit into that area of being distressed, disturbing, or dysregulated. And the answer to that is no. And the reason why is that we have uh, a lot of research and literature out there that demonstrate that mandated counseling is not effective. It does not work. And it doesn't work for a number of reasons, primary of which being that in order for psychotherapy to be a, uh, a a, uh, an effective uh, tool, the goals of that therapy have to be mutually agreed upon by the, uh, the, the therapist and the client. And when an individual is forced into a therapeutic relationship, they're not choosing that. And so they're not choosing the goals for that. And so it tends to be an ineffective approach. So there are some legal and ethical considerations that we have to, to look at. And also, we have to look at how the counseling center is aligned among students' perception. Is the counseling center viewed as a, an extension of the judicial or disciplinary process, 
or is it a place where I can go and get help when I'm experiencing significant distress? Uh, go ahead, Scott, next. So what we use is a uh, process called mandated assessment. This is a model that was uh, created initially uh, at the University of Illinois by uh, a counseling center director by the name of Paul Jaffe. Uh, it's now being referred to as the Jaffe model. We use this model here at Carolina, and it involves mandating a student to four sessions of assessment. And the goal of that is for us to evaluate the student's current functioning, whether or not they are harmful to themselves or others, to look at what led up to an event uh, that created concern among staff or faculty, to look at the, the history and lifetime, uh, the family history, and also the student's history with regard to mental health issues, and then finally to discuss some of the university policies. And uh, one of the things that a lot of people are surprised is that we have a policy at Carolina that makes it uh, against the rules to be suicidal. And so um, we have to educate students about the fact that we have a policy about that, um, and uh, among many other policies. We've expanded this model, though. We don't just look at students who present as a suicide risk. We use this approach to deal with all students who we find to be either distressed, disturbing, or dysregulated. And it allows us to get them into the counseling center for us to assess how they're doing and the big goal for us is to try and hook the student into a counseling relationship where they are uh, creating goals with a therapist to work on in a psychotherapy situation. <clears throat> Go ahead, Scott. Class absenteeism is an important factor in uh, looking at how students are functioning. Many uh, people, I think, for uh, up until recently have looked at absenteeism as an indicator that students just aren't committed to the educational process that perhaps they're partying too much or staying out too late. And what we've begun to found is that absenteeism is an important factor in uh, how students functioning emotionally. And typically students who aren't showing up to class, many of them uh, may be experiencing this depressive episode or may be in some sort of distress. And class is, is one of those things that they're just not, they're not functioning at, they're not doing that. So, we have uh, followed a uh, program at, at Mississippi State University called the Pathfinder Program, and we're uh, fortunate to have Katie Lynch here at this campus who's kind of headed that up. And our approach now is to really try and look at creating academic responsibility among students by looking at the causes for that absenteeism, including some of the emotional factors that might be going into that. And again, it's a way for us to use uh, a university program is a conduit to getting students into the counseling center so they can get the help that they might need if they're having some problems. Um, a number of studies have been done looking at what's recommended among college campuses. I won't spend a lot of time on this, uh, on this slide, um, but basically um, it's important that uh, students and families become educated at the orientation process, and I don't mean just freshman students, I mean transfer students, graduate students, any new students on our, our campus become familiar with the services that are available on our campus. I uh, met with a student today who, uh, who basically is coming close to graduation and didn't even know the Counseling Center existed, and so we've got to work uh, also from a Counseling Center perspective on marketing our services better so that students are aware of what we have going on. Um, faculty and staff need to educate themselves about mental illness and we have later on in our slides a resource slide that has connection to uh, our website and there are links to a variety of different mental health sources so you can learn about uh, various mental illnesses that exist. And uh, of course the Counseling Center is doing outreach services and I think most importantly on here there should be a no wrong door, door policy. It should be uh, a practice that when a student walks into any staff or faculty's office they can get connected to a counseling center that all staff and faculty are aware of the services that exist on campus and can get those students into that. Go ahead. So I think one of the, the important questions that all of you may be asking is how do I intervene with a student and I think what's critical is that you take time to listen and hear what that student's concerns are. Don't make it a passing conversation in the classroom. Uh, do it alone and use appropriate body language. Show that you're interested in what is going on with that student. Clarify what the student is saying. This is critical because a lot of students will throw things out there and you'll find yourself going, I wonder what that means. Ask. If a student says, I can't take it any longer, find out what that means. What can't they take any longer? Um, 
I think it's important to approach students from a position of concern and take ownership of the concern that you have by using I statements. It, it's not helpful to say, you're not doing well, you need to do better, or you need to handle stress better. It might be better for you to say, I'm concerned about how stressful college seems to be for you. And then you're taking ownership of that concern and it's not quite as threatening. Be compassionate, accepting, non-judgmental. Uh, we may have judgments uh, about how students handle things, but if you want to be helpful, uh, it's important for you to kind of reserve those judgments and just be validating about where the student is, how they got to that place, and how they can get help to get out of that place. Give information about where they can get help, uh, and frequently that's the best kind of help you can give. And, you know, if your concerns ignored uh, escalates, um, you know, it's, that's, a, that's a potential avenue for you is to go to the BIT team, the behavioral intervention team, and get uh, some intervention from that point. The bottom line is the behavior is the most salient factor in what we're looking at here. Um, a student's involvement in counseling, them taking prescriptive medications or, or getting judicial sanctions is no guarantee that the behavior is going to change. And so we continue to focus on the behavior even after a student's been involved in the counseling center. And um, what, we've, what we really try and do is focus on code of conduct issues and whether a student is in violation of code of conduct and use that really as the benchmark for, for what we're going to do in these situations. I want to uh, tell you a little bit about a, an exciting program that we have. We have a grant from the uh, Suicide Prevention Resource Center. Uh, Lisa Mustard is uh, coordinating that grant. And we're going to be offering trainings uh, beginning quite soon in a program called Campus Connect, which is a program created by Corey Wallach. Some of you may have heard of the Question, Persuade, Refer uh, program, which is called QPR, and it's uh, been likened to CPR for students who are in distress, that you might be concerned or suicidal. This program really goes a step further and gives uh, people who participate some skills in engaging students in conversation and relationships. Because we know that students who feel like they have a connection with somebody are more likely to take the advice and recommendations given by the people who are giving help. So uh, as we begin to uh, bring this program online, I hope many of you will go back to your, your uh, respective departments and, and put in a request to have this Campus Connect training done. We want to get as many people on campus training this as we can. Uh, we've got to take an ecological approach. We have to basically look at student health and mental health as something that is uh, uh, cared for from every aspect of, of college resource. It can't just be the counseling center. It can't just be the health center. We all have to take a role in creating an environment that is safe and healthy and respects the individual rights of, of people and really helps people get the resources and, and services they need if they're not doing well. And uh, one of the things that we're going we're gonna to shift to now is really looking at, just go ahead and go through that whole slide there, uh, is, is looking at how uh, policy and procedures sort of uh, the rubber meets the road and I think what's important for us to, to focus on is that you know institutional management of risk is an important thing for us to to focus on but we also have individuals that we have to be concerned about and we now have some case law that are really um, kind of showing us the way as far as institutions who use policy that uh, don't respect the rights of the individual and those policies that are too lax and result in, in tragedies and so if we balance these two needs, I think we're going to find that we achieve the kind of positive outcomes that we need. I think that's, uh, that's it for my portion. I'm going to shift it back to Scott now. We want to take this, oh, I think you picked up mine, sorry, that's all right. I want to take this a bit to the next, about to the next level and talk a little bit about what happens at the juncture at which you involve the behavioral intervention team. As Pete alluded to, and I want to build on, um, I want to kind of give you a quick history of the behavioral intervention team so that you can kind of understand the, the model from which you took it from, or the model from which we took it. Uh, Pete's right, we looked at the Jaffe model I guess about two years ago and found that that was dealing primarily with suicidal ideation and suicidal attempts. And one of the questions we asked ourselves at that point is, are there other behaviors in which students are engaging that could be considered self-injurious or where an intervention might warrant some sort of a mandated intervention that could be suicidal attempts. And the one that jumped out at us the most was a student who's hospitalized, involuntarily hospitalized. Let's say they drink too much and they're taken to the hospital. I know what you're thinking, never happens on a college campus, but uh, <laughs> I'm here to tell you it does. Once or twice a semester, a student may be hospitalized. Um, our, our dilemma is when that student is hospitalized, 
um, all joking aside, we're unaware as to why they engaged in that level of drinking, let's say. Was it an attempt? Was there some intentionality to it? Were they being self-injurious on purpose? Or was it a situation where it's just an accidental, um, I don't really know how to drink and this is my first time cutting loose and this is what happens. What we chose to do was to take the jockey model and err on the side of caution to say, we're going to intervene there as if there was some perhaps intentionality to the self-injurious behavior. And what we were able to do then is take our hospitalizations, take just the suicidal and su uh, suicidal ideation and attempt, expand it to involuntary and in some cases voluntary hospitalizations, and expand it further into behaviors that would be considered to fall perhaps under our mental health disturbances policy or uh, erratic behaviors as we refer to it, where they may become so disruptive to the mission of the institution, so disruptive to the classroom, or perhaps even disruptive to their own ability to academically progress, that it could become sort of academically dangerous to them as well as potentially physically dangerous. The goals of the behavioral intervention team, thanks Pete, are pretty uh, obvious. One is to balance the educational needs of the student and the mission of the university. Now you'll, there's, a, there's an absent piece there that some of you may be considering that Pete alluded to a moment ago, and that has to do with measuring it versus risk. Um, the BIT team, or the BIT, the BIT team I guess is redundant, mm -hmm. the BIT is not a risk management tool. Uh, one, of my, one of the things we constantly say when we do these types of presentations is if you're, do, if you're engaging in a practice purely for the reason of trying to eliminate risk or purely for the reason to avoid lawsuit, then you're probably not doing it well or you're going to eventually end up in lawsuit anyway. And you probably are anyway. You're really just sort of pick, picking how to manage the risk. And so what we prefer is we want to measure the needs of the student and the mission of the institution. And if we're doing that well, then we should be in good shape. We also want to provide a structured method for addressing the student behaviors that impact the university community, something that we know we do consistently every time, although we're handling it on a case-by-case -case basis. Not every student is going to end up exactly the same way but we know the intervention will be the same every time. Um, we want to initiate appropriate intervention without punitive measures. Now, one of the pieces of that that somewhat seems counterintuitive is the chair of the behavioral intervention team, as you'll see in just a moment, comes out of the judicial office. And so it's the office that is in charge of disciplining students is the same office that chairs this team. Uh, at one juncture when we were first sort of going through this and talking to other schools about it, they said, why isn't it the, the counseling center? Why aren't they chairing that team as the appropriate intervention authority? And one of the reasons is the counseling center may find themselves in a situation where they're having to engage in a therapeutic relationship. And having to mandate assessment and engage in a therapeutic relationship is counterintuitive to their mission. The other piece is one of the things that happens is if a student refuses to be in assessed, if they refuse to go through this intervention, there's a juncture at which we as the institution may make a decision to separate them from the institution, either involuntarily um, by some, you realize the police will be here in a moment, or perhaps we have to do it through the judicial process using a behavioral um, misconduct or some failure to comply. And if we do that, the person who leads this committee and this team needs to be someone who's in the business of removing students from the institution. Well. Sad to say that's kind of my business, is I'm the guy who suspends people. And so I'm, I know what things go into that. I know what offices we need to interact with. We know who needs to get a letter. We know what the potential fallout is from family, constituents, and the potential of, uh, as much as I hate to say it, the, the inevitable lawyer call that will come down the pipe when we do this. And that's part of the gig for our office. And so we're used to handling these kind of things. Lastly, it's to eliminate fragmented care. Um, one of the things that we've noticed in, in situations where students have engaged in abhorrent or maybe even violent behavior on their campus is it's not unusual for after the fact faculty or staff or administrators come out and say, oh yeah, I'd seen some behaviors and I'd been talking to that kid for a while. You know, and then you, they, suddenly everybody comes out of the woodwork and it turns out two or three individuals might have been attempting to intervene, but nowhere, any, no one anywhere has sort of come together. And so at USC, we decided for both for those three instances, the hospitalizations, the self-injurious behaviors, and the erratic behaviors, we were going to designate a point team. And that's going to be the people who can collect those behaviors so that we don't have this a sense of fragmented care that in, eventually um, could fail the student. The members at USC of the behavioral intervention team, well, there's really only 
two, and it's a bit of a misnomer because there's actually four standing members of the behavioral intervention team, and that's myself, Elisa Cooney out, out of the Judicial Affairs Office, Russ Haber, the director of the Counseling and Human Development Center, and Pete Leggett, who you saw a moment ago, the associate director. And the four of us are the core of the team. The four of us, and the reason we have four of us instead of just two of us is if one of us is out of town, ill, we want to make sure somebody's here on point handling these incidents as they come in. There's a BIT meeting right now. Yes, in fact, <laughs> we're past 2 o'clock, so I guess we're all past our BIT meeting time. Um, and that's not a joke. We actually meet once a week. Um, by design, our team gets together to discuss anything that's come up. Now, if, knock on wood, there have been no cases over the course of the uh, last week, we update on the cases that we've handled in the past, make sure everything's moving along as it should, and then, uh, if not, we just have discussions about how is it working, what can we do better, what can we do worse, is there any new case law or, or formulas or models out there we should use. The list to the left there is everybody else who we call in on an as-needed basis. USCPD, housing, uh, disability services, the general counsel's office if we need, student life, the registrar provost, and other faculty staff, which may include you. Now, I want to take a moment here to address that because when we invite other folks into the behavioral intervention team to participate in the process, generally speaking, you are probably the referring individual. You sent it to us, and we're in a position where we need to engage you and get information from you about whatever individual it is we're dealing with. I don't want anybody in this room or watching this to think that that somehow, and I'm, if, I'm going to say this as politely as I can, somehow offers you carte blanche into everything that's going on with that student as far as our intervention. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. What we hope to do is get the information from you so that we can gather the appropriate information and make the appropriate intervention. That we're not trying to cut you out. We understand that you brought that student to us. But please keep this in mind. You may not have been the only individual who referred that student. And when we did follow-up with the Counseling Center, with the Police Department, with other faculty, with University Housing, with Student Life, there, that student may have come up in a number of areas. And so there may be a lot of information, including stuff that were shared by their, uh, the individual himself or herself, their family, that the less people that know, the better. And so please don't feel slighted that we're trying to say, we just need the information that you have and thanks for giving it to us, and now we've got to kind of cut you out of the process. Rest assured that if we felt that you were somehow in danger or there was a safety concern, that we're going to call the police department. Um, I'm, I'm always stunned a little bit when I get a call from faculty or staff or some of our students that say, I feel very unsafe and I've called you first. Um, <laughs> wrong. I have no gun, no taser, no pepper spray, and certainly no arrest authority although I'm working on it. Come on, Chris, help me out. Uh, I don't have any of those things, and so if you feel like there's a health and safety risk, and we're going to keep coming back to that, I'm the wrong person to call. But we'll engage you folks. There is uh, actually a case that is, is going on right now that I think um, the faculty have been just tremendous. Uh, they've referred. They've kept it very quiet. They've kept as few people in the loop as they think is appropriate, and they're very conscientious in all the information that they share with us to say, Things like, I recognize that you can't tell me back what's going on, but if you could give me a general picture of what y'all are doing, that would be helpful. And so that's where seminars like this are born. So um, the categories that we have as we address, bless you, the categories that we have are category one where we're talking about ideation or attempt or self-injurious behavior. Now there's a number of behaviors on our campus that constitute self-injury. And uh, obviously the category twos with the involuntary hospitalizations could fall into those. But we have faculty who call uh, either our office or the counseling center where they're concerned perhaps about a student who uh, may, may appear to have an eating disorder or may be engaging in cutting behaviors. And that's a completely appropriate referral to call the counseling center to get some guidance on that. Um, we actually have an eating disorder management team on our campus that has the same kind of uh, uh, collective approach to trying to help you deal with it as well as help the students kind of become more educated and handle the issues as well. The last one, the one that's come up the most as of late, is the erratic behavior, the mental health disturbances. And certainly with the incident and the tragedy at Virginia Tech, it's the one that's drawn the most media ire, which is what do we do if we just have somebody that's acting erratically? And as you can imagine, over the last um, week and a half, 
our three offices, the police department, the counseling center, and our office have been inundated um, with faculty and staff who have said things like, well, there was this guy, <laughs> you know, back in October. I remember he turned in a paper, and when he turned it in, he looked odd. You know, <laughs> can, can you do something about that? And what we don't want to do is create a knee-jerk reaction where everybody's worried about every student that acts a little unusual. As you saw from the statistics Pete provided, a lot of students are coming in diagnosed or likely to engage in one bout of depression. We want you to be aware of those, but let's not overreact and think that we need to remove everybody or mandate some sort of assessment for everyone. On the flip side of that, I'm glad they're calling. I'm glad that people are saying, you know what, I got this now. What do you think? Because as in the instance I was just mentioning, the student that we're dealing with right now, um, when we talked to him, then suddenly we found out some of his classmates were suddenly coming up as well, and some other faculty and some other classes he had are saying, hey, we're noticing this pattern, and it's all very recent. And so we're able to, now we're able to intervene with appropriate information and step in and make the steps that will help that student helpfully either be able to maintain their academic progress here and get the help they need, or at some point we may have to make the decision where we can get the student to, to know that it's perhaps time that they step away from the institution for a while. We've, had a, we've been doing this now for, uh, on a pretty consistent basis for one year. We piloted it for the first semester, and we've had a great deal of success so far. Um, in doing these, just so you know what happens, once you institute the referral, we do a little bit of investigation, the team gets together, we make some decision. Um, within about two days after, two to three days after you get the referral to us, obviously if there's an overt suicide attempt or suicidal ideation or violent behavior, there's going to be some things that will move a little quicker and involve some other agencies. Um, but for the most part where they're acting radically, within two days we're going to have something in their hands from one of our offices that says, hey, we need you to go be assessed. We want you to go talk to somebody. And we're going to talk to them about what, why we're doing this. And the, mission, the message is generally, we're doing this because we care. We're doing this because we don't want this to be a punitive measure. We're concerned, and so are other folks. Um, we don't have an involuntary medical withdrawal policy. So uh, uh, we've had a few folks that have called and asked, you know, gosh, they're acting really odd. Can't we just withdraw them? And the answer is no. There's a couple of reasons for that, one of which I'll get to in a moment. But generally speaking, when you talk to some of the leaders in, the, uh, leaders in research in the community, the education community, like Gary Pavella, for, for instance, it generally recognizes that involuntary medical withdrawal policies are not the best practice. Um, one is there's some legal issues with it in terms of violating federal law. The other problem is it just seems to be the elimination of the problem as opposed to trying to see if you can work through it. Remember, for the most part, these are students who are functioning quite well. They may be only having some, some difficulties in certain classes or in certain situations. And we have the ability and we have the resources to assist them for the most part. Um, we're going to make the judgment at which point we can't do that. We rely on our code of conduct as well as opposed to some sort of an involuntary policy. If a student refuses to be assessed, if a student refuses the help, the, the helping hand that we're giving, if a student refuses to address the behavior, um, I don't care what that professor says. If I want to stand up and yell in class, I'm going to keep doing it. Well, actually, you're not. Um, what's going to happen is you're going to be separated from the institution. And we have a code of conduct that deals with that. So we don't need to provide some sort of a weird medical reason for taking you out. Uh, the last two cases there at the bottom, uh, Pete alluded to uh, Shin v. MIT. And they're great examples. Uh, both Scheisler and Shin are both great examples of universities um, that had varying degrees of uh, intervention with the student. In Shin, it was a very designed, very patterned intervention that had a bad result. And, um, Maybe the university tried to take on some things that um, they were incapable of doing. Maybe they didn't. Anyway, the only thing we know about Shin is it's settled, that it never went to court. So there's no judge's opinion on the matter that determines whether or not MIT acted uh, inappropriately or not. Uh, with the G, uh, George Washington case, um, that's one, as uh, Pete noted in this slide, that it's an example of it going too far. And that's where they do it's an automatic dismissal. If you are suicidal or IDA, you're out. Um, we're just going to dismiss you from the institution for that. Uh, and while we, while we do have a suicide policy, 
it's sort of sub to the mental health disturbances policy. And so one of the things we're going to do is put, in a, put ourselves in a position where we're not doing things like kicking students out just for acting erratically as a knee-jerk reaction. A few words of one of the reasons Pete thinks. Um, one of the reasons we don't is because uh, the ADA exists. And there is a theory um, that a student who attempts suicide, despite being against our policy, actually then by definition becomes part of a protected class. And so we can't kick somebody out for being suicidal without properly assessing and intervening. There may come a time where their behavior is such that it's inappropriate for them to continue with the institution. But that's a behavioral issue. Attempting suicide if, or ideating about suicide regularly in a class and open discussion is disruptive to the coursework and it makes, it una makes the professor unable to teach the material that they're there to do or there to teach and it interferes with the mission of the university. And so understand that that's one piece of the ADA that that George Washington policy was clearly in violation of. Um, ironically, in Virginia, in the state of Virginia, they passed a law that you could not kick students out, a state law, that you could not kick students out for being suicidal, uh, for even ideating, that you'd have to go through a longer process. And um, that was just recently passed before the Virginia Tech tragedy. And interestingly enough, really says nothing new other than you have to follow the ADA. Understand that students um, who wish to be protected and wish to have reasonable accommodations under the ADA you have a duty to provide them, but they have a duty to register. And we have an office on our campus that they must be registered with. They can't simply come to you and say, I have X, so give me this. Uh, that's inappropriate. We have an office that they must register with. They would have some documentation from that office, or they would allow you to contact that office. And, there's, and uh, Karen Pettis heads up that office here on campus. And if you ever have a question about that, she is our campus expert, and you should refer all those questions to her. So if a student just says, hey, I've got this, and I need extra time on my test, you should refer them to that office. If they say they've already been, then you should be able to follow up with Karen's office to make sure you're doing an appropriate uh, accommodation. One of the dangers of inappropriate accommodation is if you just give it as a matter of, I think you have this, I, I agree with you, and so I'm just going to give it to you. Um, then you've set what the standard for reasonable is, and reasonable now means undocumented accommodation. And so that's not a position we want to put ourselves in. <clears throat> Before I ch pass this over to uh, Chris to give you a quick rundown, I do want to kind of walk you through very, very quickly what happens after you refer. When you do refer again, we're going to we're going to begin a very, very quick investigation. We're going to talk to some of the faculty, talk to some of the partners, see if this person's come up on the radar at the police and judicial affairs with the counseling center. We're going to try to gather a, a, a holistic picture of this student and make a determination then how we're going to intervene. After that, we're going to find that student and we're going to give them that letter and we're, they're going to have that assessment. And it's going to happen all very, very quickly, as fast as we can find them. Once that happens, they have the opportunity, and you can share this with students, they have the opportunity to not come in. They can say, no, 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 I don't want to go to the counseling center. I don't want to be assessed. Um, but if they choose to do that, they actually have to meet with the chair of the behavioral intervention team, me, and explain why they think they don't have to. Uh, we've had a couple of students who have elected to do that who said, you know what, I don't have a drinking problem or whatever. Um, my, my favorite one was the young lady who said, I'm not going to be assessed for alcohol use even though I was sent to the hospital. I only had a couple beers that night. And then later we determined that she had a .27 alcohol level, which are two very large beers. Um, <laughs> and so I pointed out to her that either she was swimming in a pool of beer or, in fact, um, she might have been drugged. And if she was drugged and then fed a lot of alcohol, well, that's a relatively traumatic event. And perhaps she should talk to somebody about the possibility of that because if you can be drugged and have to ingest that much alcohol, other things could have happened as well. And so perhaps you should talk with somebody who's a counselor, not me, to help you work through that. For the most part, students have been very receptive to, to this, and we've had very few issues with students who've not gone through the assessment, not gone through any subsequent recommendations of the team, including group therapy, individual, continued individual sessions, and in some cases, off-campus treatment as well. What it allows us to do, though, is have a good, appropriate intervention so that we can step in as a university that's trying to help the student matriculate and as more of a caring approach as opposed to a punitive approach. Now, 
there's going to be an instance where the police need to be involved, either by the behavioral intervention team, but what I want to do is uh, introduce, introduce Chris Wichnick, who's going to come up to you and talk to you just about when you should notify the police and, and how they can assist you as well. Chris? Thank you, Scott. If I can take just a moment, and I apologize if you're familiar with our, you, our organization here, the Division of Law Enforcement and Safety, but I want to let you know a little bit about us. One of the, one of the common expressions we hear is campus safety and campus security. And I want to be very clear about something. Yes, we are responsible for security and safety on campus, but we are a police department. All of our officers wear a badge and a gun. They all go to the Criminal Justice Academy here in South Carolina. They're all commissioned by the governor of South Carolina as a police officer with statewide police authority. Our officers can make an arrest in Five Points or the Horseshoe or Myrtle Beach for that matter with the same police authority. And, and we are here as a tool and a resource for the university, for OSJP, for faculty, uh, for housing. Uh, we've got many, many of, our, of our partners that we are involved with regularly and I feel like we're providing, hopefully, a quality and professional service. We've been nationally accredited for over a decade and last time around, the end of last year, we received flagship status. That was a way of the commission saying that not only are we doing a good job, we're an example for others of how to do that job. That's a little bit about us. We provide a professional law enforcement, a police service to the university. When should you call the police? That's the fundamental question I was asked to answer. And it, it really comes down to if you feel unsafe. I don't mean something isn't right. I mean I'm scared. It, this, I cannot do my job either because of fear for myself or for someone else, or I can't do my job as well if the disruption is so great that I can't teach. The disruption is so bad, I cannot educate the others. You know what? Call us. We will deal with that problem. When we come, we will deal with it. We will find an immediate resolution to those issues an immediate resolution, not necessarily long term, not necessarily lasting. That's what OSJP, that's what counseling is here for. And as much as they're a tool for you, they're a tool for us as well, and not just in these circumstances. We, over the last several years, have, have really developed a relationship where I've come to truly respect and, and, and count on and rely on those advanced capabilities that they bring to dealing with problems, whether they're with students, uh, uh, behavior, or, or risks, in a long-term, lasting way. The very real reality of criminal justice is it's a short window of influence. Okay? Uh, this is a lasting influence, whether it's probation, whether it's counseling, uh, whether it's just the follow-up meetings that they're able to mandate. Uh, they're able to have a, a much greater impact, and we've come to respect and utilize that uh, not just in these, but in, in regular, regular routine activities of ours. As, as I mentioned, the, the removing someone from your classroom is a legal authority that we have. There are laws. The, the most common one is disturbing schools. It is against the law of South Carolina to disturb a school. And that disruption that is so great that you can't teach is the textbook definition of that. And if someone's doing that, we have the authority and the ability to come in, use the physical force necessary to stop that, remove that, and allow you, faculty, to continue teaching, to continue that process uh, unimpeded. Now again, he's going to be back, or she's going to be back, uh, the next day uh, with, with hopefully some, some added influence uh, from OSJP and others to change the behavior in a lasting, long-term way. One of the other questions was, if you're being harassed off campus or electronically, we've got very good relationships with all of the other law enforcement agencies around. We, we deal with them, again, because of the nature of our campus being, being very open and spread out in, in, in almost a daily basis. We are, we are very uh, fluent and proficient in dealing with uh, computer crimes and other, other issues that, that you may be harassed by a student, you may feel uh, threatened in those ways, particularly if it's electronically and it's coming to your office please call us. Those are the types of things that if, if it isn't going to be our case, we can get it into the right hands and help you deal with it, as well as get student judicial involved in terms of if it's a student that's, that's treating you that way. 
one of the last things I did want to address uh, is if, if you are off campus and you feel that you're, it's, I'm not safe, that it's just not right, particularly if you're in your car, one of the issues Scott and I were discussing earlier, don't stop, keep driving, and dial 911. Uh, that number works on campus, it works off campus. Uh, and, and get the assistance of professional law enforcement involved if you feel unsafe to that point of, of fear. Uh, and and get, get help to you. Uh, that's, what, that's what we're here for. That's why, that's why we wear bulletproof vests and that's why we have guns and badges and tasers uh, and other, other options available to us. Scott? You want to take question one? Sure. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we have some questions that we've prepared and uh, we also want to give uh, folks that are here uh, uh, today an opportunity to ask questions that you might, might have as well. Uh, but the first question is, uh, what is the proper response to students' disruptive behavior in class? And, and uh, again, I think what we've tried to lay out for you is that there are different levels of distress that, uh, that students present with, and it's important for you to, to really react to uh, in a way that's consistent and congruent with whatever the level of distress is, is that is being uh, portrayed to you. If a student is, is coming to you at the end of the semester and saying, um, I'm really stressed out, and uh, this has been a really hard time for me, and so forth. You know, uh, as, a, as an educator, as a communicator, you have the ability to engage a student in a dialogue about that and to, to explore different options with students that, that may alleviate that. To the extent that students begin to engage in behaviors that make you feel uncomfortable or unsafe, that's, I think, when you begin to look at outside, option, outside resources. I think speaking to a department chair or a dean about uh, getting some support to deal with that student is an absolutely appropriate uh, thing to do. Um, and then certainly uh, calling the Counseling Center, we're happy to provide phone consultation to any staff or faculty about a student they have concern with. Um, and then if you have questions about code of conduct issues, um, and I, I believe this student is breaking some rules uh, that are contained in the code of conduct, that's when a phone call to the Office of Student Judicial Programs or Scott Lewis would be appropriate. And then I think, as uh, Chris outlined, when you feel like you are really uh, uh, in some danger, that's when you, you escalate up to the next level. Uh, the next question is, what is my role in dealing with a student in crisis in and outside the classroom? Uh, and uh, it's the same question, excuse me. Uh, encourage, support, refer, and report if necessary is really what we've just spelled out, is to engage the student in increasing levels. The question we get a lot is what activities um, should be reported? What activities, what symptoms, what behaviors should be reported? The answer is really anything that causes you some concern. And I want to be sure I differentiate while I've got everybody here um, the, a couple things. One, I want to make sure everybody's drawing a very clear distinction between behavior that would cause the behavioral intervention team to go into action, erratic behavior, suicidal ideations, self-injurious behavior, versus behaviors that would cause judicial affairs to go into action, which may just be uh, behaviors that disrupt the classroom, throwing chairs would come into that, uh, throwing books, punching other students, things like that. Um, and, and all of those things could also, that, that list of examples, yeah. the immediate support available to you, again, is, is, is our folks, right. the police. And on a lighter note, anything that it prevents you from being effectively able to perform your duties, and that applies to staff and faculty. So the student who consistently answers their phone in class and engages in a conversation, um, anything that becomes disruptive, but certainly I, I would hope that you would not contact law enforcement for that one, um, that you could uh, let the student know what's appropriate and then if they continue the behavior, contact us. Err on the side of caution, you know, what do you want to report? Report it all. We're always very pleased in both in my role in judicial affairs as well as in my role with the behavioral intervention team when faculty or staff send us the note that says, here's what happened, I talked to the student and I feel like it's okay that we've handled the situation that they're answering their phone in class or that their behavior is such and they indicated they're going to counseling and I think we've got it under control and the behavior has not repeated itself as of the next class. Getting that message when it happens makes it much easier for us to intervene the next time. Now we've got sort of a history and I, I, we absolutely don't mind getting the messages from faculty that say 
Scott, I don't want you to do anything. I'm just letting you know what happened and what I did about it. It puts us in a very good position for the next time, especially on the judicial affairs side, where a student's behavior is overtly disruptive, and then they come in that second time and they say, gosh, the reason they're sending me over here is that professor just hates me. There's no real, it's all animus. I never did anything. And a very legitimate question that we get from, fact, or from students at that point is, if my behavior was so bad before, how come they didn't turn me in the first time, you know, three months ago? And it's better for us to say, actually, they did tell us about it three months ago. Um, we just chose to let them be the nice person, the good cop, as it were. No, no offense. Uh, <laughs> uh, let them be the good cop, and then let us be the bad cop. It seems like, you know, uh, Professor Perkins was trying to be nice about it, but now you got to come to us, and that's unfortunate for you. And so uh, that allows us getting that documentation up front. Again, err on the side of caution. If you're worried about it and you think it might be, come to us, but no, one of our first reactions is always going to be, have you talked to the student? Have you talked to them? Have you intervened? And if your response to us is, gosh, I would, but I'm just terrified, we're going to talk about the level of behavior and we're going to say, man, should we have escalated this to the police department already? Go ahead, Pete. To who do you report them? Well, first, your dean or department chair. That's a good person to be sure. Um, assistant deans, associate deans, you want to let folks who are in faculty administration in the loop on what's going on. That doesn't mean you use them as your sole reporting mechanism, uh, but certainly as a CC to that email is very, very helpful. I've given our OSJP email. That's the one that our staff check every day. Um, and then as well as our front line that has voicemail. The Counseling and Human Development Center is, uh, the phone number's up there as well. And then I've given dispatch and administration for USCPD. Those are, if I may, Scott, I'm sorry. Those are both non-emergency numbers. As I explained, 911 um, is the, the universal emergency number for assistance. If you have a, if you have a landline, a, a, a desk phone in your office or in your, in your classroom, 911 works. It'll get to us uh, in our dispatch center. If you only have a cell phone, 777-9111 will get to us for emergency response as well. So again, those are both numbers for our, our non-emergency issues. They will get you some assistance, but, but best option is always the 911 or 777-9111 from a cell. And dispatch is a 24-hour demand number as well, or staff number, my apologies. I think it's always a good idea to incur, if you're teaching a class, uh, especially a University 101 class or a class of freshmen, to, to get them to program the cellular telephones with the 777-9111. So if they are calling for an emergency on campus, they're getting to that. Well, that's, we've added some other resources on here. This, uh, this presentation is going to be available at the Center for Teaching Excellence uh, website, so you'll be able to access these slides and these resources whenever you want. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, all three of us have our offices and staff in our offices who are willing to come and talk to your individual staffs or to another group on more in depth. And just to give you an example, for example, with the, with the classroom disruption and some of that behavioral intervention, one of the sessions we do is we actually bring some case studies in and talk to the fact about now this happened, what do you do now? And to try to get you some good reactive practice for you and the other faculty on our campus. We have uh, just a few minutes, about five, 10 or 15 minutes to open this up to questions to folks in the room. I don't believe we have phone capabilities. So if you have a question in the room, please let us know to who you're addressing the question and we'll have them come up and answer. Yes, sir. This is going to throw all three of you. Will you take a moment to, to give us guidance about the possibility, God forbid, of a gun or guns appearing on campus in the hands of one of these distressed, disturbed, dysregulated people who is going over the top? The question. Any kind of guidance about what we do as classroom teachers or office people? Okay, the, the question is for those folks who, who are uh, watching who could not hear. Um, is some guidance to be offered for if one of these disturbed, dysregulated, or dis distressed. distressed students were to come onto campus or into your office, gun in hand. Um, the initial part of your question about what can I do to stop them from having a gun in their hand, uh, I, I would address your state legislator and federal legislator on that. Uh, but in terms, I, I don't have that authority. Um, I'm working on it. Uh, but in terms of uh, what to do in terms of general safety, Chris, you want to, I mean, we, we tongue-in-cheek a yeah. little bit. We said, what do you say when a guy comes, what do you do with a guy who comes in your room gun or a knife. with a gun or a knife? Chris? Well, not to, not to be put on the spot too terribly bad. The, the, the specifics of every case are going to be different. Generally speaking, the best advice is 
do whatever you can to stay alive. Okay? I don't mean to be flippant about it, but each case, each incident is going to have its own multivariable set of factors that could change whether or not and how you need to respond. You do whatever you can or feel you need to to stay alive. You also try to get word to us. You try to get word to law enforcement. And, and, and our response, again, likewise, will have a multivariable set of, of factors involved depending on the specifics of where and when and how uh, that just really aren't appropriate to go into in quite the detail I think you want. But do what you can to stay alive. Get in touch with law enforcement. Allow us to be able to, to respond immediately with the tools necessary to stop the threat. I'd like to say one, one thing about your question, and that is that uh, the research that's been, that has been done on school shooters and so forth, especially by the uh, Secret Service, demonstrate that the, the rates of this are monumentally low. It's a very, very rare event. And um, they've looked at the individuals who have engaged in these behaviors, and there certainly appear to be some common factors among the individuals who do this. But they're not enough to create any kind of profile or to, to really create any, they don't have any predictive value. Uh, per se. Um, we, we engage students the best we can if they present with one of those concerning factors. Uh, and um, have we stopped this from happening? We'll never know. We just are never going to be able to know that uh, if we did or not. Um, and so I, I don't know, I take some comfort in, the, in how rare this occurrence is. Um, there are some common factors that, that do present pretty commonly in a lot of the students we work with. We've just got to do our jobs in engaging those students and really addressing some of the concerns we have and providing them with the resources that we have to, to kind of get them to a better place. And if I could understand that the, the level of threat varies from walking in the court classroom with a gun all the way down to, and to give an example of a student we had who sent an email to one of their faculty and, and finished, the, unhappy with their grade, finishes it with some of the effect of, I'll tell you for whom the bell tolls. Well, that's uh, that's pretty veiled threat, yeah. but it allows us to interact and intervene with that student to let them know what appropriate behaviors are and what kind of flags that sends up, you know, and and what the message they're really sending. Because a lot of times they don't mean to; they're trying to be flippant or smart, and uh, they come across as threatening. And so we have to intervene in those methods as well. But uh, Chris gave probably the best guidance: if they come in with a gun, stay alive. Uh, right here, please. What is what is the university going to be doing and and uh, help us as classroom teachers if there's something that's happened? campus during the day that we'll be notified about keep students in the classrooms, don't leave the buildings. What is going to, what is happening at that level? There's actually, there's a, another presentation that began about the same time that was involving <laughs> those issues of communications and, and technology uh, that are in place and that are in development. So it would, it would be, having been here, it would be, in, it would be uh, inappropriate for me to try to, to, so to what, what what the answers are. What will we learn about those? Uh, again, that was, that was another meeting that was happening at 2 o'clock. Yeah. yeah. And actually, there is a, the, the university's emergency protocols. Remember when we talk about emergency protocols and critical incidents on campus, you know, the ones that happen with far more frequency are hurricanes, floods, fires, tornadoes. Those are issues where communications go down, where you do need to keep people in. Those protocols and the university's plan on that is actually on, our, on the web, university's website. So you can look to see what's going to happen as far as what we're doing you know, and moving toward, um, you know, Ernie Ellis and Bill Hogue and that crew are far more adept about that, but I'm, they're going to let us all know uh, via the emergency plan. Uh, everybody's learning from this, and one of the interesting things in the aftermath is that uh, we learn that you cannot develop a protocol or a procedure for every possible contingency, and each contingency presents such unique challenges that you know, to say keep everybody in the classroom or get everybody out of the classroom, um, you know, in one instance that could be keeping everybody in can be very safe, and another that could be incredibly dangerous. And so each one is going to be played out as law enforcement guides us in that scenario. Yes, ma'am. Would we be wise to carry cell phones to our classrooms so that we could communicate? And if so, if you put that in writing, it'd be a text <laughs> the question is, should we put in writing that you should take your cell phone to class so that it can be a text? Actually, it wasn't the question, but would you be wise to? Um, I, I don't think it's a bad idea, Chris. I mean, from a safety perspective, I, have, I carry mine to class. I turn it off. I have the same expectation for myself that I do for my students. Um, you know, the number one disruption we hear about from faculty and the big, biggest complaint you all have is 
cell phones going off and students texting. So I've got, I carry mine if there were to be a situation where I feel like I need law enforcement, you know, their number's programmed in into my phone so I can call them quickly. What, Chris? what I would try to say is I encourage you not to try to separate your classroom safety from your personal safety the rest of your life. Whether you're going to the mall and you're going to the parking lot late at night or you're leaving your classroom going to the parking lot after work whether you're going to the grocery store or the convenience store or whether you're going to the Russell House. These issues are about your personal safety. General, uh, cell phones are a valid personal safety device. Uh, keeping them charged, keeping them on, uh, are, are, are valid things that you should be doing if you have the phones for your personal safety all the time. It's not just about whether you're in a classroom or whether you're at work or, or, or whether you're, you're at home. Uh, these are these are general steps that apply equally across your across your experiences throughout your days. I have a yes, ma'am. Uh, we have a student list serve that goes to all the students and faculty, and within the last couple of weeks, we had some Questions. nasty exchanges between a couple of students using really bad language. Would that be something that we would report to you? Is there something that we could do? We well, <laughs> yes, you can report it to us. Um, the question is, on a public list, sort of the use of, of bad language. To uh, each other. To one another. Now, understand that there is, when you create a listserv for students to engage in dialogue, if they choose to engage in dialogue with language that they perhaps would not use, let's say, at church, um, <laughs> engaging in the dialogue, doing some name calling, certainly you can establish rules for your listserv that say, you know, this profanity is not allowed. You can have some general overall rules for your listserv. You know, we only engage in, you know, appropriate, polite dialogue that respects the rights of everyone. Same as you would do in your classroom. It's almost like a virtual classroom when you create that. Now, if, if you're trying to prevent them from doing, uh, if, if they're saying something that is veiled as a threat, or, you know, uh, I'm... I'm going to beat you up in, in probably much more flowering language than that. Uh, something along those lines. That's a different level. But understand that students that send, and this is, we do get this one from faculty quite a bit where the student has sent the faculty member an email or uh, a staff member and it has some, inter what we would consider inappropriate language. I, I wouldn't want anybody cussing at me in an email. Can they do that? As long as it doesn't rise to the level of disruption or threat, they absolutely can. Does that preclude us or you from having a conversation with them about the appropriateness of the email, about understanding that communicating with faculty and staff via email and including one another on a listserv, one, becomes public forever and can be brought up later on, and two, uh, should probably be treated like a business communication because uh, these are people for whom later, from whom later you'll ask for reference letters and things like that. If it rises to that level of disturbance or threat, certainly we're going to take action. Um, perhaps the police will take action as well. If it's just derogatory, if you've set up appropriate rules for your listserv, um, then it might be in violation of the rules and they would lose, you could preclude them from having access. But again, first and foremost, recurring theme, have that conversation with them. Students today come from a generation where email has never not existed. Um, text messaging has always been a capability for them, our freshmen. They've never known a world without it. And so they're used to speaking in the you know LOL and stuff like that and they're used to being very curt and they have this false sense of anonymity and so they say things via email that they would never say to you in person and they've come to our office and said well I mean I didn't really say it I just typed it you know <laughs> and, and, and so we have to have that conversation with them so it depends on again those questions the level of disruption yes sir Scott uh, this briefing probably could have happened in Virginia Tech before the thing happened um, what my concern would be is does Scott and you know, does Chris have the resources to respond, say, to the business school if something like this happened? I mean, I don't know what your response time is to the different areas on campus. Just like this was a two-pronged attack where he had a, uh, an incident on one end of the campus. And the right. well, one without one getting into too terribly many specifics yeah. about this case, because it will come out, uh, and, and I don't want to seem at all like I'm being critical uh, or like I'm being at all critical, uh, but I do want to point out, we're, we're a full service law enforcement agency. We've got a very professional staff. Our numbers are such that we, we are able to respond to emergencies, both in uniform and non-uniformed non officers, uh, in under three minutes anywhere on campus. 
depending on, again, see, again, these are all depends upon, okay? Our, 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 our history shows, the past shows, that we respond to emergencies in under three minutes. Uh, Non-emergency calls with, within five or less. Again, but those are all, that's what the past has shown. Um, I, I, I have a great deal of faith in our organization. We have, we have a, a, a good number of officers. The administration has been very supportive of our division over the last few years. Um, we've been able to grow a little, uh, and we appreciate that. And we've, we've been able to, to, through their support, improve our capacities and our professionalism and, and our resources that are available to, to you and the rest of our community. Good. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, as Peter <coughs> said, uh, gun-related uh, cases occur very seldom. And in my 25 years, I've had only one student who was involved in it. Unfortunately, he took his own life after telling me that he thought that he would take mine first. But anyway. Coming back, all this is very good, but let's say, look at the resources. I will not remember any of this alphabet soup. See, uh, uh, who do I look for? Let's say if I have a question of either uh, student in, uh, issues or threat to myself or whatever, where do I look? Is there one simple place I can say search emergency or something on the, uh, on the website, your website, and get all this information or what? The, the question is, is there one simple place you can go That's to right. for all this information? In the, and the answer is remembering any of these. What is the answer? Story? The answer is twofold. One, yes. if it's an emergency, it's 911. If it's a health and safety emergency, it's 911. They are your answer there. If it is a health or safety emergency, 911. If it's a question about a student, the no wrong door policy that Pete alluded to for students. So when they come to you, you know that referral out is out there. You know we would hope that you would either uh, keep, you know, during Creed Week we hand out you know pens and. There's, there, there's brochures from both the Council and Human Development Center as well as from the uh, Judicial Affairs. You know, if you need to keep it posted by your office, it has to keep those. Certainly, Student Affairs website has a list of all, of all available resources. And so it's taking that moment with that student to say, let me help you find. But that no wrong door policy, we hope, would apply to myself and the That's PD right. and the Counseling Center as well, where if you have a student in distress and you call and say, here's my situation, if we are not the appropriate office, we're going to make sure that you get to the appropriate office or that they get to you. Um, that should apply with staff and faculty as well, we would hope. So um, we have time for probably one or two more Scott, questions. these are all also on the home page. The US, division. Okay. Yeah, the, no, the USC homepage. If you go to the USC homepage, these offices are listed on the, on the homepage. Actually, you click on university offices, and they're all on there. So it's a one click to them. Yeah, Among the offices, others. offices are there, but you know, I would not uh, know. Uh, should I contact uh, Student Affairs? But if you had, uh, say, because BIT, I'll never remember. Okay. Uh, but perhaps uh, uh, I'm just trying to see human development or counseling. Maybe that's where. Fantastic. I go. And what the counseling center will do is they'll refer you. That, you know, if they'll either answer your question or has happened earlier today. The counseling center was the point call for a faculty member. They referred this, the person to us. Or this time is, is this the yeah. place where you have all those bean bags? Yes. Oh, I've, I've taken my students for the last, you know, I don't know how many years. It's like opening a big jar. Yeah, so I, I, I fall asleep and students say, are you lying there snoring? <laughs> Fine. My the, age, the infamous bean bag. <laughs> yes, sir, behind you. Um, what's appropriate to get the BIT involved if as far as like a student on an individual basis, you know they're distressed, but they will not seek out. You give them the counseling services number, but they won't, they won't take advantage of it. The question is, what if the student is distressed? You're clearly seeing the distress as you've intervened as a faculty member or staff member, and the student says, you know what, I'm just not going to go. That's absolutely appropriate for you to let the BIT, let myself know uh, through the OSJP email with an incident report, as it were, and that's just an email, or by phone and say, hey, here's the student's name, here's what happened, I'm concerned. We're going to call you back, find out the level of concern, find out what happened, and if we determine, after doing the investigation, talking to the partner scene, and this all happens very quickly, by the way, if we determine that that student needs to have a mandated assessment for their own well-being, then they're going to get it from us, not from you. And uh, the question we always get from faculty then is, 
Well, I don't want them to know that uh, you know, I'm the one who kind of kicked them over. Um, we will try to provide that level of confidentiality. It's generally easier if we've gotten it from multiple sources on campus, because then we can say, there's a number of folks on campus that are concerned about you. But if there's only one, I'm going to call you back and say, you know what, I, I need to tell them. We're not going to do things to, to try to put you in danger, um, but we want to let them know that you, you care. That you're concerned. That's always the way we catch it. Pete? I want to say one other thing also. If you call a counseling center and you speak to me or Russ or any of our other staff, one of the first questions that we're going to ask you is, what is the student's name? And we're going to write that name down and we're going to take all this information down and then without you knowing, because I can't tell you, if that student is being seen at the counseling center, I'm going to go straight to the therapist and talk to them about the phone call that I've just received so they're aware of what's, what's going on outside of the sessions out in the community. I think the other thing to, to, to mention, and I, I mentioned this earlier, is about staying persistent. And it may be that you approach a student on one occasion and talk to them about your concern, but nothing happens. But it might be the second or the third time that you approach a student that they finally say, okay, I'd be willing to do that. And so I think, you know, don't, don't be disheartened if the first time you talk to a student, they don't, they don't take action. Because it might be the second or the third time they begin to trust you and see you as a, as a, as a safe resource for them. And understand that the staff in the Counseling Center and the staff in Judicial Affairs, we have this conversation with students a lot. So we're not unaccustomed to trying to convince them that perhaps they need some assistance with managing their stress or whatever it is. I'm getting the signal here. Is it, do we have one more question and that's it? Or? You're out of time. <laughs> right, we are out of time. Lauren will take a question after. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I have dealt with all the offices that you represent, and I've had great experiences with them, <clears throat> with students in distress, as recently at the end of this semester, several of them, in fact. So thank you for being there. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Unfortunately, one of my jobs as the teaching center director is to end meetings, even though they're, they're going out very well. Please leave uh, the evaluation forms um, for us. If you're watching this online, please use the online evaluation form. And thank you all for participating. I enjoyed watching it from the overflow room.